Uh, my name is Gwenda B. Davey, and I'm the chair of the Melbourne branch of the Friends of the National Film and Sound Archive. Welcome to you all. Most of you here today come from different locations, certainly as far as Western Australia, in the case of Ian Wandsworth. And uh, but uh, I want to acknowledge that wherever we are, wherever you are, uh, we are on Aboriginal land. We pay respect to elders past, present and future and look forward to the signing of a treaty with our Indigenous population. Today's Q&A is following our online viewing of which we've all had a chance to do of Daryl Delora's film, The Edge of the Possible about the building of the Sydney Opera House and its Danish architect, Jorn Wilson. The discussion will take place, but thank you very much, Daryl, for your generosity in allowing us to show your film today. No, to have the talk about, but to have shown your film earlier. The discussion will take place between Daryl Delora and Ian Wandsborough. Daryl Delora is one of Australia's leading documentary filmmakers, and he's the receiver of numerous national and international awards. Daryl collaborated on the writing of The Edge of the Possible with Ian Wandsborough, who's here from Perth. Thank you, Ian. Ian is an experienced film writer and documentary script editor. He's also worked as a film production manager. He's collaborated with Daryl Delora on many of his documentary projects, including Mr. Neal is entitled to be an agitator, Conspiracy, The Edge of the Possible, Harry Seidler Modernist, and the current project, The Search for the Perilous Letters, which we are all eagerly awaiting. <laughs> If you would like to ask questions or contribute to the discussion, please use the chat function and make sure your sound for the present is muted. Now, uh, well, I'll say now, welcome to uh, Daryl and Ian. And Daryl, would you like to begin? Thanks very much, Gwenda, and, and thanks everybody for coming along. It's great to, to see you all. Um, I might just say a few words by way of introduction and then um, I'll let Ian say a few words if he wants to and then we can just um, go straight in uh, to some questions. Uh, we started making this film many years ago now in the 1990s and um, it came out of interest I had. I'd, I'd read a really interesting article about Utsun and I didn't really know anything about the, the story, um, except in a very broad brushstroke terms. And when I read this um, long article, I think it was in the Good Weekend magazine, I was just horrified at what had happened to him. And the fact that we really lost a great project in one way. I mean, we secured an incredible building. There's absolutely no doubt about that, but <clears throat> given that the glass walls that enclose the building and the interiors of the building are not Utzon's work at all, we really missed what could have been an incredible um, piece of architecture in Australia. And as it turned out, the only thing I really knew about the building before I started reading about it a bit and got interested in the story was what I saw from the outside. Um, going across the Harbour Bridge when I lived in Sydney. I don't think I'd ever really set foot in the, the Opera House. And that's one of the things that they told me at the Opera House when I started making the film, that their biggest problem was getting people inside. Um, so tourists would come, you know, in their millions and look at the building and look at Sydney Harbour, but they wouldn't actually necessarily go inside the building. And I certainly hadn't at that point. And the more I found out about the story of Woodson's work on the project, the more sort of horrified I was, I guess, at the fact that he'd never been able to finish uh, an interior or enclose the building with the glass walls that he had planned. And when you see his models, um, you realise what we really have missed um, out on. And I'll just give you one small example in relation to the glass 
walls, Utzon had a very precise and interesting kind of architectural philosophy. And that was that he saw it at architecture as being a reflection of the natural world. And he therefore had a kind of approach which was a very, very much a modernist approach, but it was sim to look for the simple way of achieving the best result. So when he planned the glass walls, he was inspired by the wing of a bird and the shape of a bird's wing and the way it would curve. You know, if you remember the film, he often uses this sort of gesture with his hand frequently. And that curved shape of the wing and the articulation of the bird, the bones that hold uh, the, the bird's wing was something he tried to emulate in the glass walls. And it was a very subtle sort of draping effect that also gave you a sense of maybe a curtain, a stage curtain falling and that kind of thing. It was very, very carefully and subtly thought through. And as he designed the glass walls, he worked out that he could make every single pane of glass in those glass walls um, the same, basically the same. So you just cut out individual and multiply them many, many times and then put them into the the mullions that, um, that hold it all together. And it was a very simple and straightforward process. When the new architects took over at the direction of the uh, Liberal Country Party government under Premier Askin, they decided that their approach to the glass walls was would be to use the most sophisticated computer that existed at the time to create every single pane of glass in that glass wall a different shape and a different size. And it was so against everything that Utzon stood for it, that it um, is an extraordinary example. And when you look at the glass windows now on um, <coughs> the, the Opera House, you realise that they are a sort of well, it's personal, I suppose, in some regards, but I see them as a very vulgar expression of what could have been there. And there's no doubt that they took inspiration from what Woodson had already designed in his models and his drawings, but it sort of bulges out. It doesn't have the sense of smooth sort of articulation that he was looking for. So I just feel that we lost an enormous amount when, um, when Woodson left. And because of that, I guess the... Um, feeling all the way through when Ian for, and I first started writing the script was that it was very unlikely that we'd ever have input from Woodson himself because he had a bad relationship with Australia, basically. That was certainly the impression we had, that he, after all, he left the project um, very suddenly. He never returned to Australia. He never saw his building finished. Um, he was never given a reference by the New South Wales government, which meant that every single project and um, award, he, he went into a lot of competitions, he wanted to go into competitions, he was hamstrung because they would always ask what was the last thing you did. And of course, he did this extraordinary project, but didn't have a reference. So it was a real destructive force um, in his life and there's no doubt that it affected him enormously so our feeling always was that it would be very difficult for us to get to him that he probably would not want to be involved in a project from a group of Australians from the ABC we had um, by that stage support and um, so we never predicated the writing of the script or the film in any way on his involvement so we sort of always hoped that he would be involved somehow, that we'd be able to get him involved, but we never wrote the script with that in mind. In fact, we wrote a script that we knew that we'd be able to make without his involvement and that we'd be able to tell that story without him. So when he finally did agree to be interviewed, it really was an extraordinary addition and it took the whole project to a, a different level, really. Um, which made it, you know, it was a wonderful 
sort of serendipitous thing in many respects because we'd written the script um, probably around 1995, 96, and we'd sent it to the ABC and they'd said, no, we're not interested in this, and they chucked it in a bottom drawer and we never heard from them again. And then in about February or so of 1998, I got a call from the ABC and they said, oh, did you write a script about the Sydney Opera House? And I said, yes, yes. And he said, well, would you be able to make that film by the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the opening of the Opera House? And I said, well, uh, I'm not sure. And they said, do you know when that is, by the way? Because <laughs> they didn't know. <laughs> and I said, ah. And I went away and I said, yeah, it's, it's October this year. Uh, that was 1998. And I said, yes, we can make it by then. So that's how we got the gig. Otherwise, you know, if it had been March, we would have said, well, we can't make it in four weeks. And they would have said, oh, bad luck. And presumably shown some other <laughs> movie on high rotation or something. But um, so it was a very odd way that it came about. And then Utzon's involvement was even stranger because although, of course, we'd written to him many times and encouraged him <coughs> to be involved in, in the film, uh, we never got a response. And I became very close to Woodson's major lieutenant on the project, which is um, a man named Mons Pripples, who's in the film. And we discussed the project at length over a long period of time. And he was reporting back to Yawn all the time on what we were doing. And he was giving us a very good rap and so suddenly out of the blue, when we arrived in Denmark, we just got a phone call saying, you know, when are you coming out to interview me sort of thing. And it was like that was the very first time we had any contact with him at all. But he'd been following our progress um, throughout the entire time. And uh, so that was a, a sort of wonderful moment, really. Um, so... Yes, it's been a, it was an incredible journey to go on the making of the film and um, it was something where I think I decided very early on that what needed to be said was people need to, to sort of understand Woodson's architectural process and his theory and his ideas behind why he wanted to make that building the way he made it. and. Strangely enough, even the Sydney Opera House itself didn't give Utzon much respect or due back then in the in the mid nineties. It was sort they were sort of embarrassed by him. He was the guy that sort of failed and was thrown out of the country. So they didn't have much down there that referred to him. That, of course, has completely changed now. And I like to think that our film helped in that change because. It was only a week after our film screened on the ABC nationally that Bob Carr wrote to Utzon and asked him to return to the project as a consultant uh, on the refurbishment of the building. And that was a really major step. And now, of course, if you go to the Sydney Opera House, they um, really talk a lot about Utzon and they have an Utzon room that they've refurbished and, you know, it's it's a very different scenario there now from what it used to be. Um, but, yeah, so anyway, uh, that's probably enough for me. I might <laughs> hand over to Ian and uh, if he's got something he wants to say by way of um, an introductory remark. Indeed. Thank you, Daryl. Um, it was a slightly different project for me as well. Daryl first proposed it in 1995, and by that stage, we had already been working together for 10 years on various films. And most of those films were documentary, and our field, if anybody had asked me, would have been to say that we worked on Australian history and politics, and particularly the politics. So when Daryl first proposed a film about architecture, the making of the Sydney Opera House, I was a little bit taken aback. Um, I knew very little about architecture. 
And I knew very little about the Sydney Opera House in spite of the fact that I'd been living in Sydney for nine years by that stage as well. Um, I'd been to performances at the Opera House and thoroughly appreciated them. I knew that it was a magnificent building in a stunning setting on Sydney Harbour. But like most people, I knew very little about the history of the project. And of course, Daryl's conception of the film was that it really was about Australian history and politics, I should have known. And he, once he'd started talking to me about the project, I also got very excited. And we began researching, we began talking to people who might eventually be interviewees on the project, we read as much as we could, and we started working on a script in the way that we'd been working on scripts for quite some time up till then. I was quite proud of what we'd developed as a, as a way of working collaboratively on film scripts. We would spend quite a lot of time researching together, uh, we would then spend a lot more time structuring the film, trying to work out exactly how a film could be pieced together to do what we wanted it to do. And we would structure it to the extent that we knew where individual bits of the film would be so that either one of us could write those pieces um, knowing what would come before it, knowing what would come after, knowing what the other person was working on. And then we could even swap our writings over and rewrite what the other person had written and try and bring a script together as a coherent piece in its own right. So we were producing what was, for documentary films, very, very detailed scripts. We also did audio recordings with most of the people that we interviewed so that we could use direct quotes in the script itself. And that gave the scripts very much a feeling of what the, the completed film would be like. So we worked for the best part of a year on that script, probably not quite that long, it was 1995. By mid 1996, we'd finished the script and uh, with my partner and two young children, I was about to leave for Perth, where I've been for the last 25 years. So for me, it was a very different, it was a very instructive experience because it was, it was very different. I came to Perth knowing that it was very unlikely that I was going to be involved in the production of the film if we ever did get to make it. And at that stage, it was very uncertain that it would be made. When the call from the ABC came through to make it, and Daryl and our producer Sue Maslin began the process. Um, I got reports on how things were going and I was very jealous because I was in Perth and I wasn't making films and these two were getting to go to talk to people all around the world about a very, very interesting project. Um, I got reports, of course, and but I hadn't seen anything until almost the final cut for the film. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, I thought we delivered a tragedy, but the input of Jörn Utzen was so gracious, so forgiving for the appalling treatment that he'd received on the project, that the film was turned into something really quite different. He hadn't, as I thought at the time, undercut the tragedy at all. The poignancy was still there, the tragedy was still there for what might have been, had he been allowed to complete the project, but he'd taken the film off in a different direction entirely so that it could actually be a celebration of what was achieved and the sheer fact that a project of this scale could have happened in Australia at that time at all. And I, I think that's the joy of the project now. And that's really because he's such an extraordinary man. He's such a gracious interviewer, interviewee and his love for the building itself and the, uh, his experience of being able to work on that project just comes through so strongly. Uh, perhaps if Daryl's going to say anything more, I'd probably ask him to talk about what it was like actually to interview Jan Utzen, because I would love to have been there at the time. Oh, thanks, Ian. That's, that's fantastic. Um, well, I, I can answer that for you. And I think 
the thing comes he comes across on the screen exactly as he is and was uh, as he was and that is he's incredibly generous i think his generosity intellectual generosity and art, artistic generosity are there for everyone to see but he's a very um you know charming and and was an incredibly generous person and so he gave up you know um two or three days of his life really for us and just was open to do whatever we wanted him to do, really, um, and speak about whatever we we asked. So um, it was wonderful from that point of view. But it was also a very strange experience for me because, as someone who looks a lot at archival film and did that and did a big archival film search for this project and you know, as someone who's a member of the Friends of the National Film and Sound Archive, of course, that's a crucially important part of the work that, that I do. And you can see that in, in this film. And so I'd only ever seen him as a 40 year old in archival footage from the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And suddenly to see him in the flesh in front of me, was a really strange experience and all the more so because it was like that 40 year old was there in a, an older person's body he just shone out in exactly the same way as he had in the archival footage and um so it really was um a, a wonderful experience to interview him but also quite strange for someone who had already got to know him so well through hours of, of reeling through archival film of his interviews and so on and um, and photographs and all the rest of him, but never to actually have, have seen him in the flesh. So um, that was a, yeah, that was the, the really striking thing for me as a filmmaker to, when, I, when I saw him, mm. yeah. I think it's the core of the film, <laughs> but yeah, and well, in more ways than one, is. obviously. Yeah. And if he'd never agreed to be interviewed or we ha hadn't been able to interview him, he still would have been there incredibly strong at the centre of the film. And oh, yeah. the fact that we did, of course, made it very different. But, yeah. yeah. And shocking to me at first, and it took me several, it took me quite a while to get used to the fact that it wasn't the film that I had thought that we were making. Yeah. But... It was so much better again that it was a joy to have been part of it. It really was. And perhaps we should uh, pass it back to the, the two people controlling this session and uh, maybe yes, invite you sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, does anybody have any questions that they want to ask either or both, um, Daryl or Ian? Well, Bruce, I noticed there's one here from Chris that says what happened to the original structural engineers. Um, I can certainly answer that. Um, the, the structural engineers throughout the entire project never changed. They were OVARP and partners from beginning to end. And they, of course, are a huge film firm <coughs> based in London. And um, they hang their hats on the Sydney Opera House. If you go to their London headquarters in Fitzroy Street, you can see a huge model of the Sydney Opera House in the in the foyer, the atrium foyer, they they are everything about them is we built the Sydney Opera House, so um, that that's what happened with Ovaraps and um, throughout the making of the film, we were you know critical to a certain extent of Ovaraps and, and their role, and we were very worried about being sued because they were very much about defending their reputation. So we could have been quite a deal stronger, uh, probably in terms of what we said about our Arabs, but unfortunately we couldn't afford <laughs> what might have been the consequences of that. But I think the bottom line is that the structural engineers, it was a very unfortunate situation where the structural engineers worked directly to the client and they didn't work through the architect. And that's completely not the usual way that architects work. Architects hire structural engineers and they're hired on the basis of, can you do 
can you put my architectural vision into reality, create it, can you build it? They're not there to say, actually, we work with the client and the client doesn't like really what you're doing or want something different or we've told them that they should do it differently or whatever it might be. That's not usually how the process works. That should it's usually filtered through the architect. So that was that was really the beginning of the end of the project when that arrangement was put in place from the very beginning. Mm. Yes, on the structural engineering side of it, um, from my perspective, it seemed that the that Ovarup and partners had their nose out of joint when they could not solve the initial problems to do with Utzon's plans. And it was Utzon himself who came up with a plan in the end that was really quite breathtakingly simple, but breathtaking nonetheless. And that perhaps should have been something that Ove Arabs had, might have been able to solve as well. I think they, from that moment, were a little offside. And when it came to the interiors that Utzon had been designing for quite some time. He'd really advanced plans for the interiors. Um, the structural engineers basically decided or said that they could not be built, that they did not think those structures that he was trying to build could be done. They'd said similar things about the exterior, so they should perhaps have known that here at least was an architect who was going to solve the problems, who was going to come up with something really quite exceptional. For the interiors, he was also working on the edge of what was possible with the materials and the technologies of the time. And I remember speaking to some architects while we were researching for the film, saying that had Utzon been allowed to build the interiors that he had in mind, they were likely to have changed building practice for the next several decades all around the world. They were that striking and that interesting as building technique hmm. and that for us was the tragedy that that was the part of the building that never got to be made um, we got to learn about that tragedy well for us in 1995 when we started researching for other people a little bit earlier there had been an exhibition in sydney at the opera house uh, demonstrating what those or showing those plans and some of the models that Utzon had been working on at the time and that was really the first time that the public got to see what he'd had in mind for the interiors and they were stunning he was really to my mind what he was trying to do inside was to create the impression of sitting inside a perfectly tuned musical instrument and what we ended up with was relatively conventional interiors that led to a joke that was current at the time. I'd heard the joke, it was one of the few things that I knew about the Opera House at the time, and the joke was that Australia had the best Opera House in the world. The exteriors were in Sydney, the interiors in Melbourne, and the car park in Adelaide. And that's, well, that's the first time I've heard that joke. I didn't know the bit about the car park. <laughs> okay. Well, Utzon even had ideas on how the car park could be managed, but, you know, yeah. he was never consulted on those sorts of things, so it just didn't happen. In fact, he had ideas and plans for that whole precinct on Benelong Point that would have been a completely different delivered project. And that, to our minds, that was the tragedy of the project that never got to be. But at the same time, we all ended up with something really special, and that's the Sydney Opera House as it is, a World Heritage listed building. I noticed there's um, a couple of questions here, one from Liz and one from Anne, which are similar in some respects about the politics of it all um, and the cost blowout. And look, it, to answer those questions, from the very beginning, it was a political project in the sense that the Premier of the day, uh, JJ Carl, wanted to build the, the best opera house in the world and give it to Australia, give it to Sydney. And he saw that as a, 
a political act, really, from a left-wing government, that why shouldn't people have access to the arts in a really dramatic kind of way? Um, but so, yes, it was political in, in that sense. But as Utzon says in the film, that all the political sides of politics agreed that they wouldn't make it into a political football. It wouldn't be something that they'd use for political ends once they started the project. And of course, that's totally what did happen. It's a little bit like what you see right now with the pandemic. Public health shouldn't be a political matter, should it? But actually, it's being pushed to the hilt as a political issue. And public health orders are being second guessed all the time for political reasons. Whereas that's pretty much what was happening with fairly standard um, engineering and um, architectural decisions, given that it was a building that had never been, nothing like it had ever been tried in the world before. I mean, they're still building cathedrals in Europe that they started building 400 years ago and haven't finished. It, it was conceived on that sort of scale by Utzon as a grand project. And so when people say to Anne's question about the cost layouts, there were no cost layouts on this project. No one had ever built something like this before. The idea that you could have a confined budget was ridiculous. You know, it's like um, what happened was they brought in a quantity surveyor in 1959 before even one kilogram of uh, concrete had been laid and asked them, how much is it going to cost to build this building for which he had no plans, he had no idea what it was going to be. No one knew how to build a building like this and the quantity surveyor just made it up and he came up with like something like £12,000. So the political football nature of it was... Um, okay, every dollar that this costs over £12,000 means there's a cost blowout. Now, of course, it was never ever going to cost £12,000. That was ludicrous. Um, it was one of the biggest and grandest projects that had ever been built anywhere. And the other side of it, of course, is that not one cent of taxpayer money went into the building. No one knows that either. The reason was they had a lottery. The New South Wales government set up our opera house lottery so no taxpayers funding went into the opera house at all so the whole political shenanigans that robin askin entered into damning the building because of cost overruns sure cost a hell of a lot more than that quantity so they said but didn't cost the public a cent in tax dollars so yeah the other part of all of that, too, to do with costs, was that the really major increases in cost, although, as Daryl says, nobody knew what such a project should cost at all anyway, but the major increase in prices all happened after the Australians had taken over from Woodson in 1966. There was another seven years' worth of building in which time the cost had gone from something like 24 or 25 million pounds to I think the final cost of 103 million pounds. And that was under the watch of completely different architects, a completely different team of people. But the swapping of the halls was a huge cost. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly right. As soon as they got rid of Woodson, they took that as an opportunity to change the brief completely. They completely changed the brief, increased the number of people who had to be seated in the halls. They swapped the um, the whole pur purpose for each of the halls, et cetera, et cetera. So they ripped out, you know, this Austrian stage gear, which Utzon described to me as being like cutting up a live deer. That was how horrific that was. And they sent it down to Long Bay Prison where the prisoners used it for something to do to chop up um, this massive stage tower. It was just horrific, um, all because when Utzon went, there was suddenly an opportunity to say, oh, now we can change what to what we really wanted, which is a gigantic concert hall, not an opera house. And so, you know, the whole thing 
suddenly went off the rails as soon as that happened because, the, of course, as Ilson says in the film, the interiors completely reflect the design of the exterior. So once you rip the interiors out and decide to change it all, you've got to somehow force them like a round peg in a square hole into exteriors that are already existing. You know, so that, that was a real disaster. Um, and, you know, there are so many issues that... Um, <clears throat> issues of problems that arose from that. It's hardly worth talking about. Well, as, mm. as, a, as an opera lover, um, I realised at the time they'd made a terrible mistake. Um, but not only that, that the, uh, you know, the stage machinery had been delivered. And oh, it was installed. It was all in there. Yeah. And had to be then removed. And, and the... Um, and that's why they talk about Melbourne, of course, because Melbourne's got equivalent to uh, the Metropolitan Opera uh, stage machinery. Yes. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's a real tragedy because, and as Harry Sadler says in the film, you can't put on Aida in the Sydney Opera House because there's no staging gear in the main hall and the, the minor hall's too small. So, mm. you know, what do you do? You put it on in Melbourne. <laughs> yes. And people park in Adelaide. Yeah. Oh God! No, they come by tram. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. uh, that that story about the chopping up of the stage machinery is just, you know, it's just another one example of the unbelievable philistinism that just sort of, you know, characterised the whole episode, the whole business about the opera house. You know, I mean, it's like uh, it's a philistinism, which of course it's still going on today. You know, with all the big cultural institutions and the universities that are, uh, you know, bleeding for funds and, uh, uh, and you know, not getting anywhere at all. It's just, uh, you know, it's funny. You know, I, I often think of this, um, the dismissal of Utsun as our second great dismissal in our country. You know, we've got the Whitlam, dismiss, dismissal of the Whitlam government and you've got the dismissal of, um, of uh, Utsun and they're both like Greek tragedies. They are. <laughs> um, but very much how we saw the project at the start mm. in the yeah. tragic mm. register yeah yeah could could i just um uh, uh i just add to, to, to gwenda's comment because i it's um uh it's the, the film just showed what a tragedy it was um that this whole thing was sort of altered halfway through and it does suggest something about australia that you know that the, the philistinism that um that just intrudes in in huge imaginative projects and um, kind of cuts them down to you know cuts them down to a kind of um, mediocre size. I mean, the, the the obvious comparison is the story of Canberra, which um, um, with Burley Griffin setting out this um, imaginative vision for a city, um, and he was the architect, if you like, the resident architect, and after several years, he just gave up and he left um, because the um, um the bureaucrats and the um you know everybody's involved just just couldn't handle what he wanted to do and so we he, he he established the outline of the city um and established its shape but all the other things he wanted to do he couldn't he just couldn't do and gave up and he left and um this seems to be a kind of re repeated australian story it is i agree with you ray i, I think the thing about it is if you can put, there's a, there's a sort of rider, I think, and that is Australians have wonderful ideas, but somehow there's a kind of creeping reactionary nature there that they start down the path of doing them and somehow they get dragged back and dragged back down to size and, no, you can't do that. Um, but as you see with the Opera House, with a whole range of different things, I mean, I think... Um, the Marbo decision is another really good example where there's an extraordinary achievement in the sense of that, but then somehow, you know, something happens and that the true fulfilment of that great idea doesn't necessarily come about. Mm -hmm. um, but you do have to give us credit for the, the idea in the first place it's, and the execution of it or attempted execution mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. It gets, it gets handed over to a committee, unfortunately. Yes, something like that. Yeah. Um, is it overseas? To is be it, is it, sorry, Gwenda, I was just going to say... It's oh, it's sent overseas here. to be produced. Sorry. Sorry, mm. there's a question here from someone I was just going to 
address um, about Utsun and whether he's respected in architectural circles in Australia. I think he is very much respected in Australia. And I always thought, wrongly as it turns out, that there were two places in the world where he was respected, and that was Australia and Denmark. But I went to Denmark again just in 2011, and they had a special seminar on Utsun's work. And the reason they were having this special seminar was because it was the first time that the Danish Architectural uh, Institute were prepared to recognise him because when he left Australia, it was a disgrace as far as they were concerned. He disgraced himself and he disgraced ar Danish architecture and architects. So he never, ever got a significant or any public commission in Denmark. Um, and so his so-called failure in Australia really was stuck with him for forever. And the one of the most enduring myths was that he wasn't competent and that he couldn't complete a big project. And yet, actually, he completed the Kuwaiti Parliament building, which is a, an incredible achievement, an amazing building. He built it in about three, four or five years um, on budget, on time, amazing. The tragedy with that building was that after the Kuwait, the Gulf War, the interiors were destroyed. And again, Utsun lost his interiors on a grand building and they were replaced with sort of late Baroque Saudi dictator style architectural interiors, you know, grand bloody, you know, um, chandeliers and all this sort of stuff. But his original interiors were incredible and it's a, such a tragedy for him that on his two biggest commissions, the interiors were destroyed for different mm -hmm. reasons. But, yeah. Um, just while we're talking about um, uh, Utsun's reputation, uh, Joe Wellington had a question about, um, about the effect of the film on Utsun. Do you want to ask it yourself, Joe? I will ask it. <laughs> but basically, did, did, uh, to your knowledge, did the film have an effect on Utsun himself, the fact that he took part in the film? And you've mentioned a few things that, um, that came out of it as, as a result of that. What was the impact on him himself of the film? Yeah, look, um, I was really gratified with the impact on Utsun himself. Lynn Utsun, who I got to know quite well, his daughter, she told me that the entire family uh, gathered around the TV set to watch it and they were all in tears um, by the end. And Utsun himself told me that participating in the film was him answering a long unanswered letter to Australia. So in um, many respects it had a great effect on him. It was the beginning of his um, thawing of his relationship with Australia and the New South Wales government. He then started having a formal relationship with the New South Wales government as a result of um, uh, Bob Carr's approaches. And in typical Utsun style, um, in 1966, he took legal action against the New South Wales government and, interestingly, Neville ran a, a later Premier, represented him, Neville ran QC. However, he didn't ever resolve that case and what he was asking for were, was his fees that uh, Davis Hughes refused to pay him and his outstanding fees were $300,000 in 1966, which is a lot of money in those days. He never got that. In 1998, when Bob Carr arranged a contract for him to return as the consultant, Woodson asked for one thing, and that was $300,000, which of course was a hell of a lot less in 1998. <laughs> but that's what he was paid, his totality. That was his fee for coming back as consultant on the project. 
So it did change his life dramatically. I'm not claiming that change was totally from our film, but it was part of a process, I think, which changed um, Woodson um, in terms of his relationship to Australia. Um, he suddenly was back, really. And because of health reasons, he would never travel to Australia again. He, he didn't like travelling much in any way and he wasn't particularly well, so he would never have come back here. Um, and also people often ask me why, you know, it must have been terrible that he never saw the finished building. But if you think of it but from his perspective, when he left, everything that he had done on it was done. He built the podium, he built the shelves, he put the tiles on the building of his building was there. He saw that. If he was to return, he would see, be like seeing your work with someone else's daubings all over it. And I don't think he ever wanted to see that. So he's very gracious in terms of the way he describes a building and how much people love it and so on. But he wouldn't have wanted to return to Australia and see the finished thing. It would have been too heartbreaking. That's certainly mm. my opinion. Um, but yeah. Yes, I think it. I think it did change his relationship to Australia dramatically. I think he saw Australia as a different place by then um, when we we came back to him to make the film. There was one other change as well that he hints about in the film, which was a gentle um, suggestion to people in Canberra and to people in Australia generally to support the idea that the building be recognised by UNESCO as a World Heritage Listing. And that process was started at about that time by Bob Carr and the idea that some of the building would be refurbished and that there would be an ongoing program of maintaining the building so that it could become a UNESCO listing. And of course it achieved that. So that was another major change at about this time something that Utzon had obviously dearly wanted and got. Yep. There's another question that Gary sent directly to me, um, but I'd, I'd, uh, so you wouldn't have seen it, but um, I'd ask Gary if you invite Gary to ask it himself, if you can. Uh, yeah, I just uh, I was aware that the title of the film, The Edge of the Possible, comes as a quote from the Tao Te Ching. I'm just wondering whether we know how much of the actual design of the Opera House was influenced by Utzon's obvious interest into the Eastern religion and the Taoist artistic tradition of harmony and so forth. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Yeah, definitely hugely influential. Um, he was very interested in many different things. So I wouldn't just say that it was from Taoism, but that was certainly a very strong influence. He was also influenced by, um, I think as me mentioned in the film, um, Mayan architecture, the podium that it's the shells sit on, that was very much influenced by uh, Mayan architecture. And then, of course, um, the Islamic mosques with their tiles, that was an influence on him as well. I think he drew from all sorts of places, but in a philosophical sense, I do think Taoism was important. And the title actually comes from something Utzon himself said, which was he was quoted as saying, I like to work on the edge of the possible. Um, and then the, the Taoist implications of that were drawn out later. Um, uh, but he certainly... Um, he certainly had those influences, and they were—they did come to the fore in his his thinking. Mm. Okay, um, I move on uh, to a question that uh, Ian has asked about um, about the original designs and the actual what was built. Ian, would you like to ask that, Ian Douglas? Uh, not hearing from Ian, so I will I will ask it. Um, so he asks, uh, is there a website where one can see, either pictorially or verbally, a comparison of Utzon's idea and what we see today? I'm not aware mm. of, of any, Ian. Um, 
there was a little bit of work done by a Sydney architect that I think Ian referred to before. They had an exhibition in about 1997 where he created um, the interiors um, using uh, computer generated graphics, which we used a little bit of in the film. And that was created by a Sydney architect who did it using the original drawings that Utzon had done. So it was absolutely specific to what Utzon wanted for the interiors. But other than that, I don't know of any direct comparisons. It would be invidious, I think, for someone to set up a direct comparison between the current interiors and what Utzon's interiors would look like. Um, and so I don't know of any. The only way you can really do that um, would be to go back through the materials that are housed. I think in the Sydney New South Wales Public Records Office, they've got all the drawings there or in the State Library. And of course, the existing models that we referred to showed in the film, you could look at them as well and see the difference. But I think the startling differences are in the, the glass walls that have that sense, as I said, of a bird's wing and the sort of draping sense in Utzon's um, designs compared to this sort of rather ugly bulging that you, do, you have currently now. And then the interiors, um, Utzon's interiors, of course, because they are based on using um, box, um, you know, uh, wooden boxes, if you like, um, as the forms for the interiors that would then be the actual ceiling and also a structure in itself. You don't get a very good sense of that unless you look at the the models. That's probably the only way you would you would get a sense of that. Um, and you know the the engineers over there said that that couldn't be built, but then they never really tried to build it. Whereas other engineers in Sydney said there was no problem with building such an interior, um, but that the the that the shells themselves would only partially hold the weight of the ceiling and the structure and that the wooden structure itself would also hold itself up. That was the design that Utzon had. And you will probably notice there's uh, the um, Japanese architect um, that we have, Uzo Makami, he actually built such a building in his Cherry Orchard Theatre where we filmed him in Tokyo, um, actually does one of the things that Watson was attempting to do, and that is it is a opera theatre combined with um, a concert hall, and they change around the acoustics according to what they're doing in there. And that was what, that was what Watson wanted to do in the major hall, and that is what they said could never be done, and Yuzo Makami was sitting in it. So, you know, um, it did get built. Such a thing does exist. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll move on to a question that um, was asked by um, Beth, which is on quite a different tack, which is about your collaboration between the two of you. Beth, are you okay to ask the question? Sure. Um, I just think that so many of us are having to sort of work remotely at the moment and collaborate across the distance. And you've been doing this for 25 years. So what are some tips you have for this kind of um, process, some things to avoid, the thing, the highlights, the downsides? And also um, the, the role of friendship in this, was the friendship first and it got stronger through working together? Or you know, did you start working together and then develop the friendship and just the role of friendship in sustaining yourself as an artist or a producer, a creator in this very strange world we live in? Thank you. Can I start on that one? Definitely. Beth, we're older than that. It's 35 years. Daryl and I have known each other now for more than 40 years, uh, together with Sue Maslin, the producer on this and many other film art media projects. We were three full-time students, the only full-time students in a media course in Canberra in the very early 1980s, and we've been working together on films ever since. And yes, there are some very large distances involved. I'm a bit responsible for some of that, 
But even for a lot of the time that we were working together in earlier days, when I was living in Sydney, Daryl and Sue were both in Melbourne. Um, I would spend time in Melbourne as well on projects. Daryl came up to Sydney. He came and lived in Sydney at one stage when we were making a film about the Hilton Hotel bombing. Um, so we, we have been friends, all three of us, for a very long time. And it's been a very rewarding friendship and a very rewarding collaboration as well. I think, as I tried to say a little bit earlier, that uh, from my perspective, I think we've worked out some quite good ways of being able to work together at a distance. And you can do that with writing. You do need to spend time together. But we had also that opportunity as well. All of the projects would involve visits to the other and staying with them and spending as much time as we possibly could in the early days of, of scripting a project. And sometimes also working on the, the production, which I also very much enjoyed in the days when it could happen. So if Daryl wants to add to that, I'd be delighted to hear from his perspective, but it'll be yeah. similar, I suspect. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, look, I think it would be virtually impossible, I think, to work closely as we have and collaboratively if you weren't friends. Um, that would be <laughs> very difficult. Um, but actually, I think Ian and Sue and I, and of course Sue is, is the third leg of this um, project in very, you know, very much um, and a very important part of it. Um, but we actually met, in a way we weren't friends to begin with because we were just all doing a course together. And so we were thrown in the deep end to do, to make films with each other um, before we became friends really. And that then we became friends as a result of working together um, on that, in that course. Um, but in terms of Ian and I, collaborating, Ian and I, and him being in Perth and me being in Melbourne or him being in Sydney and me being in Melbourne, um, I think we'd formed a close relation, working relationship be before that separation occurred. And so you need to be aware of that. It wasn't as though, I think it would be very difficult to form a close working relationship with someone, probably not impossible, but more difficult if you began in two separate cities and you had to do it like that. We, we actually worked out how we worked together when we were with each other. And then we could just continue doing that when we were sort of geographically separated. So, um, yeah, so it, it probably happened in that way, I think. Thank you. And we and certainly did have arguments. I can remember Daryl's partner. No, he didn't. Place. That's rubbish. <laughs> That's rubbish. Don't argue. She would, refer to, she would refer to us as zig and zag. Because, was, of different, as, because of the different tacks that we would take in an argument about what should be in the script or what should not be or how it should be. <laughs> who said that? <laughs> that was Jenny. That would be Jenny Hocking, who's also involved in many of these projects and also a very long collaborative relationship. So, yes, nice to acknowledge these things. It's been a joy. <laughs> It's just so good to hear the background to the movie because obviously you've had to cut out so much to compress it down to, you know, the amount of research that goes into a project like this is just astonishing. And then you end up with just to have to crystallise it into a one hour thing. So this has been great discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. We had also very much wanted it to be a feature length film, a longer film again, but the one hour format was pretty much what the ABC would, would, uh, would take. So it got compressed and certainly some of the material that we did always intended to be in the film was displaced by that wonderful interview with Jan Utzen. So the film very much changed in the making for the better. Um, i throw over to Chris now. Uh, you, you, made, you made this comment or question a while ago, Chris, and I don't know if you remember it about the um, structural engineers continuing with the job. Uh, do you want to ask that or do, I've got it in front of me. Do you want me to ask it? I was just curious why the uh, original structural engineers uh, continue. You, ethically, uh, you'd wonder when they said they can't be built, you'd think they'd step back. 
Well, as I, yeah, as I was saying before, I think um, normally the way projects work is that the architects um, give instructions to the structural engineers. So if, if of course, they say, well, we, we can't build this, then they would go to other structural engineers who could. But in this case, because of the way the New South Wales government set up the project, the structural engineers were on the same footing as the architect and answerable to the government directly so as the architect was. So the architect couldn't say, you know, I don't want these structural engineers. They were locked in. Um, and mm. so that's, that's how that sort of, in a way, that's why that dispute arose or that problem arose. But then they brought in Holland, didn't they? Um... Not, I don't think Holland was structural engineers. I think they were um, sort of builders. Or I thought I yeah. thought they were. I think uh, I think that uh, as far as I know, anyway, Ovarups remains the structural engineer mm. throughout. Um, but they, they they might have delegated certain things to other companies. That's they, there were people who did just the acoustics. There were people who did other things. Um, but certainly OVAP was the structural engineer. Mm. Yeah. Well, Holland's um, did that big job recently in New York because they were the only ones that could work out how to do it. Um, right. And I, th I thought there was a bit of that in the Opera House too. Mm. Yeah, I think not Not in terms of, as far as I know, the, the dispute between Utzon and the engineers was always with Arabs. Nobody else. So, mm. Mm. thank you. Okay. Um, if I might ask a question um, now, I, I, I'm really interested in um, all of the archival material that was in the film, and some of it's just fantastic to to see after all these years. Um, but also, particularly as you mentioned, Daryl, um, the interview with Utzon himself and the other interviews in a sense, make make the film itself constitute a fantastic new, at the time, archival resor um, resource. Because um, as as I think it says in the publicity, that is the only long form interview conducted with Utzon uh, either ever or since he left Australia. And so it, it's really important as an historical document, as well as a piece of, you know, film art to use <laughs> your term. <laughs> I just wanted to, um, hear your comments about about that that issue yeah definitely um on the most recent version of the dvd release um we included the full interview with utzon um sort of unedited basically um or just topped and tailed really and he'd done um something in australia before he left i think and someone might have followed him to denmark in the early 70s and spoken to him peter luck i think spoke to him in the early 70s um but since then up until we did it the only interviews that i'm aware of that he'd given were in danish um so there was no long form and certainly not to australians at all so that was the first time he'd really come and agreed to, to talk to Australians. And then even after we'd done our interview, I think he might have done some other shorter interviews with people. I'm sure he would have done that, but nothing as detailed as ours, certainly not in English. So it does remain a very significant uh, archival source. Um, and we're sort of very proud of that. And we're also proud that we, we got Utzon to do it without using the various, so we got him to do it on the merits of what we wanted to do with our film, really. Whereas other people had encouraged him to speak to them, journalists and so on, not necessarily filmmakers. I remember, I think Geraldine Brooks describes tracking him down. He just refused to speak to her. He wouldn't answer her letters. No, 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 I'm not speaking. So she went to his house knocked on the front door, he opened the front door and she burst into tears. And he said, oh, you know, you better come inside. That's how she got <laughs> interview, right? We didn't do any of that. We didn't go through his family. That was the other thing. People would go to Lynn Ortson, who lived in Australia then, had a family here, um, and get her to try and convince her father to speak to them. He didn't 
he didn't like that approach either and we didn't do that. We literally just wrote directly to him and asked him if he'd speak to us and then we got, um, uh, unknown to me, Moans Brutbus was also contacting him, telling him what we were doing and so he responded positively to our approach really. So we're quite pleased by that because we didn't want to use any sort of subterfuge or you know, try and strong arm him into interviewing, being interviewed or anything like that. That's why we always thought of the film, well, maybe he'll never be in it or maybe be highly likely that he wouldn't be in it. And we designed it accordingly. I'm so ha sad to hear that story about Geraldine Brooks. I've always loved her writing. <laughs> <laughs> I know, well, you, you know, that's coming from me, her com competition, so you probably should check that out. <laughs> um, Liz has just um, asked a quick question, which I'll convey because it's so short, is um, are other parts of the film available? So are other what? Are other parts of the film available? As in what do you mean? Oh, well, I, I, maybe I'll throw to Liz because uh, it's her question. Uh, you planned a feature and you wanted to do a feature, but you were restricted to the one hour length. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So look, there are, yeah, there are long, there, there's all our rushes. So some of them we put on the recent, uh, relatively recent DVD release. There's some, the long form interview with Woodson and there's um, some other materials that we shot with him in Denmark and there are, uh, there's um, a, DV, a, a Super 8 film, which we feature a lot in the film, that was shot at the time in the 1960s during the demonstration when he left and a whole lot of things like that. So there's a huge amount of material, actually. And one of the things I think Ian was alluding to is that part of the story we never got to tell was Woodson's work on other projects, on his yeah. other significant work, both in Denmark and around the world. And we did quite a bit of filming of his projects in Denmark. That was actually the reason we went to Denmark, thinking, well, it'd be great if we could interview Woodson, but we didn't have an interview with Woodson. So we went there to film the buildings that he built in Denmark. Um, and we would have included material on the other buildings he'd built as well mm -hmm. um, in that longer form film. So. Yeah, Thanks very much. And are you, um, while, I've, while I'm um, speaking, are you aware that um, Utson himself uh, designed uh, the tapestry uh, in, in the days before the Victorian uh, tapestry workshop, now the Australian tapestry workshop was able to do it and it was designed uh, uh, while he listened to Bach music and it was inspired by the instruments of the orchestra. And I happened to go to the um, cutting of that uh, and it was played, uh, the um, Bach music was played during the cutting. Yes, that's a lovely story. Yeah, I was aware of that. He, that was one of the things that came after we made connection with him because he came <clears throat> back to the project, of course, and one of the big things that they did was create this new Utsun room that they call it the Utsun room mm. and the tapestry hangs down mm. one side of the Utsun room. And he created that using cutouts. So paper cutouts is the original thing is paper cutouts. And then the tapestry workshop turned it into a tapestry, which is um, mm. wonderful. A bit uh, like Matisse. Yeah, exactly like Indeed. Matisse. Yeah, mm -hmm. in fact, that's exactly right. And um, so, you know, we're, we're pleased that his relationship with Australia led him to doing that as well. Um, and that's really the, that room in the uh, Opera yeah. House, the Utsun room, is the only room in the entirety of the Opera House that is completely finished according to Utsun's wishes on the inside and the outside. Nowhere else in the Opera House has his interiors, but that room does. Because well, he, how wonderful yeah. for that. 
yeah. yeah it is. And, and, and good karma, um, good karma um, is the phrase that I uh, was left with after seeing your film. Oh, great. Uh, with That's him, awesome. with him yeah. Yeah. in particular. Yeah, sure. and yeah, well done. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you indeed. It, it really is a testament to how gracious Yernutsen is as a person. Um, we're getting pretty close to the time where we should be finishing. So maybe if anybody's got any last uh, questions, just um, maybe um, throw them out now, throw them into the group. <laughs> um, otherwise, uh, maybe if um, Daryl and Ian, you'd like to just, um, I, I don't know, sum up or say anything sort of final. <laughs> Um, oh, the only thing I would say was that I, that we, you know, the the most significant person, of course, is Yawn in terms of how our film came about, and we completely dedicate it to him, and that it wouldn't have happened without him, of course, at all. But um, Ian and Sue are the second people we have to thank for the the fact the film exists, and um, Mark Atkin, who edited it, did a wonderful job editing it. Um, John Witteron, who shot it, who's brilliant photography, and Mark Tarpey, who recorded the sound, uh, and David Brady and John Phillips, who did the music, which is absolutely beautiful and haunting music, and Amelia Barden, who did the oboe, uh, played the oboe, is, is really lovely. So, um, yeah, they're the real people that should take the credit for the movie. That's fantastic. I would just add to that, that I saw it again on Friday and was absolutely delighted at how well it's standing up. And I was reminded again by so many of those elements that you just mentioned, Daryl, things like the music that to me have a, a real Taoist flavour to them as well. And the narration, I think all of these things came together in a way that to me, it's a delight to have been associated with it. And I hope it's brought, brought, some, brought some joy to others as well. It has indeed. I think, Bruce, it's time that we finish. Is that correct? Okay. Yep. All right. Well, you know, I think I'm leaving this discussion full of gratitude that we actually have as much of Woods and Sydney Opera House as we do have. And um, it's, um, I think I'm going to sit down and watch it for the third time now <laughs> after this wonderful discussion this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed, Daryl and Ian. And also thank you, Bruce, for technical management. Thank you again. Bye, everybody. See you. Thank you, Gwenda. Thank you, Bruce. It's been a wonderful session. Yes. Thank you, Daryl. Good to see Thanks, you again. Man. See you again. <laughs> Bye.